Good evening and welcome to tonight's STS-133 mission status briefing. With us today are International Space Station Lead Flight Director Royce Renfrew for this uh, joint activity on board the International Space Station and Art Thomason, the lead EVA officer for the mission. Uh, we'll go first to some opening comments from those two gentlemen and then we'll take your questions. Royce? Thanks, sir. So it was, a, it was an excellent EVA day today. The uh, crew got out the hatch a little bit early this morning got right into the EVA ops. Uh, we installed the J612 cable, the little power cable that we needed to get on, installed prior to installation of the PMM tomorrow. Uh, the J612 cable was installed, checked out today, so that's all fine. That, that activity was done. We relocated the, the failed pump module from its position on the uh, payload ORU accommodation, or POA, out on the mobile transporter. Steve Bowen uh, riding the arm with uh, Mike Barrett flying brought the POA back and, and installed it on ESP2. We got all that bolted in and got it set up so we can vent uh, about 10 pounds of ammonia out of it tomorrow, or on uh, uh, flight A7, EVA2. Uh, then uh, Al Drew went up and took care of his ops he was gonna do up at the Z1 truss. He folded back the two MLI, uh, MLI flaps we needed to expose those two RPCMs. Uh, swapped out an APFR, moved a tool stanchion to a new APFR, and brought a, uh, an old APFR back to the airlock and installed that in the airlock. We're going to do some ops on that between EVAs to take a heat shield off there. We'll bring that back out on EVA2. <clears throat> then both crew uh, met up at the, uh, at the CP3 right next to uh, Expose Logist Express Logistics Carrier number four that we installed on flight day three and put a wedge at the bottom of that camera stanchion to lean it away from the four frams or the five frams that are on the backside of ELC-4. Uh, at that point in the EVA, we were right on the timeline, had a lot of good uh, good margin left in our consumables, so we decided to, to push ahead and get the uh, get ahead task to install the cedar rail stubs that allow the MT to translate to the furthest outboard uh, MT location without having to do a CETA, card, uh, a CETA cart swap. So we got that taken care of, laid down the, the CETA stop, laid down the, the tether rail stop, and so now we can translate out there if we need to. Uh, we also picked up one other get ahead to, to uh, transfer a WIF extender from the MT over to ESP2. That was on our get ahead list, and uh, Steve Bowen grabbed that on the way by. And we finish the day by uh, uh, performing the message in a bottle activity, which is uh, capturing the vacuum of space in a bottle. It's a JAXA payload, and we'll bring that back, and uh, it'll be displayed somewhere in a museum in Japan. And uh, it, all in all, it was a great EVA, got everything done we needed to get done, and uh, I can't say enough about uh, the crew's activities today. I, uh, inside the stack, we also changed out an RPCM, uh, remote power controller module, which is really just a, a circuit uh, in our electrical power system that had been failed. We took advantage of uh, the power inhibits that we needed to have for the J612 cable installation. Those are exactly the same inhibits that we needed to change out the RPCM. So Katie Coleman took care of that for us today, powered that up, got a good integration counter when we repowered uh, node one, and, and that all worked fine. When I left console, they were uh, working their way through the EVA post activities and, uh, and uh, the crew's getting ready to go to bed uh, big day tomorrow for the uh, permanent multi-purpose module installation in the morning. And then because we don't have a focused inspection requirement because uh, the TPS system on the orbiter has been cleared for re-entry, instead, uh, instead of doing the activation on flight day seven with a focused inspection on flight day six, after we get the PMM installed tomorrow morning, we'll step right into the activation and ingress and hope to be in the module by tomorrow evening. And that's, that's really all I have. And turn it over to Art, see if he had any, uh, anything else to add. Okay, I'd like to start off by congratulating Steve, Al, Nicole, and Mike on an outstanding EVA today. Uh, this would have been a great EVA by any standard, but considering that Steve only had a month to prepare for this EVA, it's really a testament to all the hard work the team has put in uh, to get this EVA where it is today. I'd also like to thank Tim Copra for all the hard work he's put in in developing these EVAs. Without his hard work, these EVAs wouldn't be where they were today and wouldn't be the success that we saw during the EVAs today. Uh, the STS-133 EVA-1 was six hours and 34 minutes. 
Uh, it was planned for six hours and 30 minutes, so pretty much right on the timeline there. We completed all the scheduled tasks for the day. Uh, Royce already touched on most of the tasks. I'll uh, give a quick overview again just to describe those. The first one was the J612 extension cable task. Uh, this is basically an extension cord that allows us to get power uh, from the station once the permanent multipurpose module is installed. Um, this is for contingency purposes for node three in case we needed to give uh, power to node three for a contingency case. Uh, next, the vent tool and vent tool extender was routed. Uh, this will be in preparation for venting the ammonia in the pump module for EVA2. Uh, Steve then was on the robotic arm and stowed the failed pump module, moved it from the mobile transporter uh, back over to external stowage platform number two. Uh, we had a small hiccup with the space station robotic arm workstation that was in the cupola at that time. Uh, the crew did a really good job of uh, getting moved over to an alternate workstation with a minimal time impact uh, to get us right back on track. Um, also, when the pump module was being installed, uh, there was four bolts that were driven. Uh, after the bolts were driven to secure it in place, there were three electrical connectors that were mated. Uh, one of the connectors we had a problem with, and I have an example of uh, that type of connector here today. This is an NZGL connector. Um, this is a smaller version, but it's the same design as the one uh, that was used on orbit today. Uh, they start off by connecting the two pieces of the connector and then throwing this bale. Uh, as you can see, when you push it all the way down, this bale snaps into place. On orbit today, though, for one of the connectors, the connector that was actually the ground uh, for this connection, uh, they weren't able to get this bale thrown all the way down and clicked into place. Uh, it was pretty close. We left it where it was, but it's something we may address again on EVA2 uh, to make sure to do some more troubleshooting to get this back in place. After the pump module was secured into place, uh, Al headed out to the Z1 truss where he returned a portable foot restraint. This portable foot restraint had a heat shield on the bottom of it that prevents it from being installed in some of the work sites on the outside of the space station. Tomorrow they'll remove that heat shield and then bring the APFR out on EVA number two. Uh, they then headed out to the S1, S3 interface where they installed a camera wedge. Uh, this camera wedge cants the entire camera inboard so that there's room for the robotic arm to access express logistics carrier number four and stow replacements there. Uh, we then went into the get ahead task of installing the rail stubs. Uh, these rail stubs allows the whole mobile transporter and seat cart units to translate farther outboard uh, to give more reach with the robotic arm. Um, during this, this task, uh, the crew did have difficulty in um, driving the bolts that secure these rail stubs in place. Uh, they went to a higher torque at that point and everything worked fine. Uh, we just had a higher running torque on those bolts than expected. Uh, from there, their final nominal task they finished up was JAXA's message in a bottle where they captured the vacuum of space. And that is it for me. Okay. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we'll now go to questions. Please remember to state your name and affiliation. Mark? Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Carroll for Aviation Week. I had two little questions. Uh, could, you, could you describe at least approximately how long the rail stubs are and, um, and what they sort of buy you in terms of access with the robot arm in the future? If there's a piece of the station on the starboard side that you can now reach or look at with a camera or something you couldn't before. Um, and, and we can get you the exact dimensions. It's about a foot long. It's not very long. <clears throat> the trick is that uh, we can actually reach all the way out outboard of the Sarge right now. But in order to be able to do that, the, uh, the seat of carts that uh, we can detach from the mobile transporter and use to just translate them via EVA power up and down the rail. Uh, the seat of cart on that side of the truss, if we actually translate it all the way to the farthest outboard work site, the seat of cart itself would stick over the edge of the, of the seat of rails, of the MT rails. So every time we translate all the way out to that outboard work site now, we have to relocate the seat of carts so they're both on one side. So by adding that little one foot extension in there, we can now translate all the way outboard without having to spend the EVA time to relocate those seat of carts. And, and I had a, just a second question about the control station in the, in the cupola. Uh, I, know you, I know you were able to adjust but when you do the second spacewalk, will you be back in the cupola, or, or is that kind of to be determined yet? No, we, uh, we finished that off today. Um, 
the pump module has actually been stowed out on the, there's a, a, a spare latching end effector for the big arm that is actually called the payload ORU accommodation. It's a piece of robotics equipment out on the, on the mobile transporter. It's literally a spare end effector. And we use it as a, as a stowage space whenever we need to put a big payload in there. When we had the pump module fail in August, when we took the failed pump module out, we stowed it in the POA. So it's been in there ever since August. And in between that time and today, we've actually had a software upgrade for the robotic system on the vehicle. And when we did that software upgrade, we loaded some default parameters to the POA. Uh, and when we got back to it today, it, the system got itself confused because it realized it was holding a payload, but it had default parameters loaded in its software that said it was unloaded. So it had a, a conflict in its own logic there that said I can't be both loaded and unloaded simultaneously. And the, and the workstation did exactly what it was supposed to do and took itself down and safed the system. Uh, we transitioned the crew down to the lab to finish the activity, and then by the time I got to the end of my shift, we had actually figured out what had gone wrong with that workstation, powered it back up to a backup configuration. Actually, during the EVA, we powered it back up to a backup configuration just in case we needed it to go back to another workstation. But uh, we understand everything is wrong with that now. We've got it all sorted out, and we'll use the Cupola uh, workstation to install the PMM tomorrow, and we'll use it for EVA2 on flight day seven as well. Okay. Rob? Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, with regards to the mission extension by one day that was um, called up at the end of the day, uh, what do you gain uh, PMM-wise uh, with that extra day? And if the Soyuz flyabout is approved, do you lose what that, that extra um, work, or does that go on regardless? Okay, so for the first question, obviously we've got the HTV currently on the vehicle, uh, so we're out of sequence there because 133 was supposed to fly first and the PM would ar PMM would already be installed when HTV arrived. Uh, HTV, we extended HTV duration on orbit to make sure it was still there when 133 arrived, but it's it's scheduled to be undocked and deorbited after shortly after 133 leaves. So what we gain with the additional day is a, an additional day with uh, with really uh, nine U.S. crew members or 12 crew members on, total on the vehicle to help unload the PMM and get all of whatever we were going to bring home in HTV relocated from PMM over to HTV. So the plus one day actually buys us um, a, a full crew day of six crew members that we would not normally have on board the, the vehicle to do that transfer activity. So we're gonna get a lot of transfer, transfer done that we wouldn't normally be able to get done if we didn't add the plus one day. If we, if we turn around then and do the, the Soyuz flyabout activity, we really don't lose that additional transfer activity because the only the, the only crew members who won't be on board or won't, wouldn't be involved in the in the transfer ops would be the the 324s crew members. So Alex and Oleg and, and Scott, uh, the guys who are actually flying around in 24s, would not be involved in the, in the transfer activities, and we'd still be able to get a lot of that uh, a lot of that done. Uh, and on the subject of transfers, do you have an idea of how how the, how far they are right now in terms of um, moving payload between Discovery and the station? Is there a percentage or something you can provide? Um, I, I, I did not track that today. I should have checked that before I came over here. I know the, uh, the, my uh, uh, ACO transfer guys are very happy about where we're at. We're, we're uh, either right on the timeline or ahead of the timeline. I, the number I remember from yesterday is we were 40% done, so we're something better than 40% today. So we're, we're, we're doing very well there. Thanks. Uh, hey, Gina? Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. You both talked about the message in the bottle, but if you had to write a message, what would you both write? You know, I, I think the uh, this this little activity th is a great thing. It, uh, everybody gets a chance uh, to go to this museum, and I'm not sure what museum it's going to wind up in. Somewhere in Japan, you'll be able to go in there. And as I understand the, the concept behind it here, you go stand in front of this bottle and just imagine for a little while what you would fill that with. And, and for me personally, what, what that represents is something tangible that the average 
person in Japan or anybody that wants to go see this museum, go see this ar uh, article in a museum, uh, can relate to what I do for a living. And, and, and anything that, that gets that message out there for the average citizen is, is, a, is a great thing from my perspective. And, and I think it, whether or not folks think about what they're going to put in there, I think they'll all think about that this was captured on, on SCS-133 UF-5 Discovery's last mission and, and is, is a connection back to this flight for as long as that uh, message and bottle exists in Japan. And I know, Art, what, what would you put in there? Well, I agree with Royce that this is a, a great thing, and um, the crew took a lot of pictures today, so in the museum it'll be very nice to see a picture of someone holding this thing in space and then also see it right there in front of you to know that this was actually outside in the vacuum of space and held by EVA crew members and uh, still contains that vacuum today. So um, I think it'll be a great thing to see in a museum. Neither one of you answered my question. What would you write? What would your message be? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'd have to think about it before I before I throw something in there. Art? Um, no, I didn't answer your question, so. <laughs> <laughs> Chair Mina, I think Bill's coming back here. Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS, with two quick questions. For Royce, um, on the Soyuz flyby, I'm just curious, as an operations guy uh, who looks at this, how do you look at the risk versus the benefit? I mean, it really comes down to pictures versus putting some guys in a capsule and undocking, which in the past they've had problems, et cetera. I mean, how do you view that risk-benefit trade? Well, you know, you, you couch it as a as an ops. Uh, how do I look at it from an ops perspective? When when we when we fly the stack in uh, in everyday ops, we do uh, visiting vehicle activities. We docked the ATV the other day. We docked the HTV the other day. I've been on console for a number of Soyuz in progress rendezvous and undock activities. So, from a from a purely no kidding look at it from an ops perspective. What we're what we're planning to do for the Soyuz flyabout and undocking a, a Soyuz and taking it out and then redocking a Soyuz and bringing it back in is not beyond the technical capabilities of what we're what we've done with the ISS in the past and in fact it's very similar to the some of the Soyuz relocate activities that we've done in the past where we needed to move the Soyuz from one docking point to another in order to free up a docking port for a, another vehicle coming in. So from a purely no kidding technical perspective, it, this is not uh, uh, incredibly off nominal from what we've done before. I'm gonna put the, put the stack in a configuration that allow the crew to take some pictures. And, and from that perspective, the the risk trade uh, the risk trade perspective the you know that's the other thing that that we that we wind up looking at all the time is the is the technical capability to go do an activity vice what is the risk of being able to do an activity and uh, I think today's EVA is a very good example of you know we, we put two crew members outside the vehicle that's a that's a risky thing we we understand the risks that are associated with putting crew members outside to do ops and and we all get comfortable with putting them putting them in that configuration so then you have to couch that as we're going to go take three crew members and un undock them from the station and take them out a couple hundred meters let them take some pictures what is the risk that you that you bring in there and 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 from my perspective the risk that's associated with taking the crew out to take those pictures is not that different from what we normally do from our from our russian visiting vehicle activity so you know we're we're going to we're going to uh, be ready to go whatever the program decides they they want us to do we'll be ready to go execute it uh, come up uh, after they make a decision tomorrow well just the other side of that question that was the benefit part of the risk benefit trade which is when you do a spacewalk you're doing it because the station obviously needs the work done so the risk is worth it sure is the risk of flying the soy is worth getting what amounts to a an incredibly pretty picture but still just a picture Right. So if you, you you look at the benefit side of that equation, what do we get out of being able to do this? And I think, I can't even remember, we had a press conference a while back. I got asked the question about what we were going to do after the after the, the, the shuttle stopped flying for being able to capture the data for the fly around activities that we've done for a number of years with the order. Uh, the the ability to take the Soyuz out and essentially do a fly around of the vehicle is something that I assume we're going to wind up doing after the shuttle stops flying to be able to continue to capture that data on MMOD strikes and how is the vehicle actually behaving uh, in long duration in space. So part of the benefits that we'll get there is we'll have the ability to, to take a to, to take a, 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 a 
an opportunity during this mission to practice what we're probably going to wind up doing here eventually anyway. Yes, we'll get a, a, a really nice picture out of it, but there are some operational advantages as well. Be able to take some pictures of the of the side of the ISS that we don't normally see in the fly arounds. Be able to take an opportunity to see how we would actually do a complete lap of the vehicle someday in the future with a with a Soyuz with the with the crew in there taking pictures. Okay, we have a number of reporters uh, on the phone bridge, and I'm going to go take their questions right now, and then we'll come back for some wrap ups here in the room. Uh, I think first on the line is Irene Klotz. Uh, thanks. I don't have any questions. Okay. Uh, Marsha Dunn? Yes, hi. I was just wondering um, two questions. Have the Russians signed off on the fly around yet, or is the um, mission management team still awaiting that? As, as far as I understand it, uh, we're still in the posture that we came in the mission with, and that the uh, combined mission management team, I, uh, the MMT IMMT decision, will be made tomorrow on flight day six. The fly around is conducted. Would the hatches between um, the shuttle and the station be, be closed, and would all the crews go to their various uh, vessels? Um, negative. It would be we, there's a, a hatch between MRM2 and the Russian segment that would be closed, and that would be the only hatch that would be closed. The rest of the ISS would be open for business, and I fully expect to be doing transfer ops and, and other IVA ops uh, with the uh, crew members that remain on the vehicle uh, when we do the flyby. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank uh, you. Charles Atkinson. Good evening. Charles Atkinson with spaceofshoes.com and family.com. Royce, uh, following up on Marsha, what are Russia's thoughts on the fly around? And is NASA working hard to get Russia to agree for the special photo op? And is it similar to what you did on the SPS-71 uh, fly around? And, and you win the award for the worst comlink. I, I don't think I copied the first part of the question, but I'll try to answer it. If I don't get it all, you can come back. Uh, as far as I know, we're, we're still uh, we're still talking as a management team with all of our international partners, with uh, uh, with JAXA and with ESA and with with Canada and and all of the players here, including the shuttle program, and uh, and that decision will be made in the IMMT tomorrow. And I I, I hope that answered the question. My voice can you hear me okay? Uh, sure, a little bit better. Okay, thank you. It's uh, Charles Jackson with Space on Snooze and Daniel.com. Again, what I was uh, trying to say is, uh, what are Russia's thoughts on the fly around? Um, have you heard early word as far as is Russia in more of a stance of a no go on this? I think what I'm hearing is the question is, uh, what are the Russians' thoughts about the fly around? I, I don't have a I don't have a status on that. I really don't. Uh, the all the international partners will be. Uh, represented in the IMMT tomorrow on flight day six, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get what, uh, what all of the international partners' uh, assessment of the fly run will be at that time. And uh, lastly, is it going to be similar to the SCS-71 near fly around that we saw with the four years? Uh, the SCS-71 uh, mirror fly around is similar. Uh, as I, uh, w when we went back and looked at some of that, when we first started talking about this activity, in that case we took a Soyuz out and then undocked uh, the orbiter from Mir and then redocked the Soyuz. That would not be the sequence that we would, uh, that we would execute in this case. In this case we would undock the Soyuz, take it out, uh, take the pictures and then bring the Soyuz back in and then we would undock the orbiter the next day. So it's somewhat similar, but the sequencing is a little bit different. Okay, one last question. Have you heard word from JAXA, the Bay Radio, the crew, or the, or the ISS Sister, uh, with good word following message in a bottle? I did not copy what he said. I'm sorry, would you repeat the question, please? We're having a little hard time hearing you. Okay, thanks. Uh, did JAXA radio the crew uh, with uh, kind words following the uh, message in a bottle? Oh, did uh, did JAXA already talk to the crew with the message in the bottle? I, I, when I left console, I had not heard that come up from JAXA, no, but uh, uh, I know they were, they were very excited to actually have gotten it done. I've been working with my <clears throat> uh, JAXA uh, counterparts uh, leading up to the mission. They were very excited to have it on the on the EVAs and we actually had it timelined as the 
last activity today, but ARDA uh, included in EVA 2. If we couldn't get to it today, we were going to be sure we got it on 133. So they were very happy that uh, that we did the activity. I, I talked to Jay Flight uh, when they were out there at the end of the EVA with the crew capturing the vacuum, and he was very excited on the loops to, to see that uh, payload get taken care of. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we have one last report on the phone bridge, Todd Halverson. Todd Halverson of Florida Today, can you hear me? Absolutely, that's a good com, not the com link there. We'll take that one. All right, great. Um, I wonder if you all can comment a little bit more about the robotic workstation uh, crash in uh, Cupola. That seemed to be a real scramble going on with a uh, spacewalker holding an 800-pound box the size of a large chest of drawers on the end of a robot arm. And I'm wondering what was going through your mind, and, and give us a sense of how challenging it was to recover arm ops and continue the spacewalk. Sure, and, uh, and that's actually a, a good case for me to have on console because I used to set at the robo console, so my robotics officer and I were pretty much in sync there. Uh, in reality, whenever we go out and do a spacewalk where we're going to put a crew member on the arm, we always have both workstations ready to go. So in this case, the discussion really was uh, a trade space between it's going to take my robotics officer about 15 to 20 minutes to reboot the workstation in the cupola. The other option there is that she could bring up the robotics workstation in the lab with one command to take it from a backup state where we had it ready to go and make it an active workstation with a single command. So that, that would just take her uh, however many seconds that is to send a command of the vehicle or take about 15 to 20 minutes to bring up the cupola workstation. The flip side of that equation is that the crew has a lot of uh, ancillary equipment that they usually have scattered around the workstation to be doing robotics ops. So they've got all their books and they've got various uh, space station support computers and they've got uh, cameras and, and notes and whatnot and comm configs. Uh, so if they stayed at the cupola, all that could stay with them and then it would take us about 15, 20 minutes to reboot the stack or reboot the station. Or they could go down to the lab workstation where the workstation would be ready to go, but they'd have to transfer all that equipment. So what they elected to do, we, I had uh, Stan Love, my Capcom, call up with that question. They elected to just transfer down to the lab workstation to finish the activities today because they didn't really get any advantage out the, out the window views. So they took all their equipment down to the lab workstation, and it was about 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, either way we, either way we spaced it. Uh, we made sure uh, Art and, uh, and Melanie and I were talking and uh, uh, off the off the loops there at the end of uh, getting all that booted back up to see if uh, Steve Bowen wanted us to go ahead and reclose the snares on the POA so we could take it away from him for a little while, let him uh, let him relax. And he said he was fine. He just wanted to press. So from that point forward, we we continued to open the snares and and took the arm, put the pump module back where it belongs. Uh, just a real quick follow-up. Um, you know, in the uh, cupola, you have that uh, great panoramic view around the outside of the station. And in uh, Destiny, um, I believe you have to uh, rely on TV views. Uh, could you comment on the, the additional challenge of uh, doing the rest of the EVA out of the Destiny Lab, and I'm wondering uh, how both of you feel about um, the uh, the Soyuz fly around. Whether you guys individually would be go for that fly around? Okay, so let me see. Uh, first question. Uh, I'll point out that the that the 20A team, then Art happened to be the lead AVA officer on 20A, if I remember correctly. I worked, uh, I worked that uh, mission as the Orbit One flight director. That's where we installed the cupola. So we got all the way from 2A way long time ago until 20A without ever having those out the window views. So we conducted a lot of EVAs, did a whole bunch of robotics activities without ever having the out the window views. So it's, it's perf perfectly feasible to go execute an EVA just using camera views, and, and the crews uh, uh, have trained that way in the past, and we trained uh, uh, on this mission 
in particular for this EVA, the out the window views really don't give you a whole lot other than it's really nice for, for Mike and Scott uh, when they were in there operating the arm to be able to look at the earth going by when, uh, when they were waiting for Steve to give them some additional commands. But they really couldn't see the, see the ops looking out the windows, moving them down to the lab uh, really didn't impact their ability to conduct this EVA at all. Um, question two, how do I feel about the Soyuz that fly about, uh, you know, I'm an ops guy, uh, I'm ready to go execute whatever the program, uh, whatever the program decision is. Uh, I think the, the advantage of being able to go take those pictures would be, uh, would be really, would be really good. They, they would be some uh, classic pictures that I'm sure would turn up uh, all over the web and all over y'all's uh, various reporters in here, front page the next day, and they would be beautiful. If we decide we're not going to go do that, I'm ready to go execute the PMM outfitting day instead. So I'm, I'm happy to go execute whatever the program wants me to do. And as an EVA officer, uh, it doesn't really affect our system. I think it would be great to see this fly around, then um, EVA would be go for it. But uh, there's a lot of other people that have a say in this uh, that I think would have the final say. OK, is that it, Todd? Yeah, Kelly, that's it. Thanks. OK. And back here at JSC, uh, we've got a couple questions. Denise, you want to start out? Uh, Denise Chow at Space.com, a question for Art. Um, with Steve Bowen having only about a month to prepare for the EVA, I'm just wondering if you can comment on how challenging it is for an astronaut to jump into something like that and pick up um, choreography for two of the EVAs in a relatively short time. Yeah, and we typically have about 10 months of training to get ready, um, and usually the crew member that's assigned to this flight will help develop the task all along the way and uh, get things the way that he likes them. Uh, in this case, Tim helped develop those, those EVAs all along the way. We were ready to go. Uh, and when Steve coming in late, um, he really had to rely on Tim and his expertise to really explain how he performed each task specifically. Um, so I think because Steve uh, just flew on 132, and he has a lot of experience EVAs, a very talented EVA crew member, and because of Tim's hard work that he's put in, uh, that combination allowed this to be a success today. Anything else? Philip? In the back. Actually, since you're going that way, why don't you go ahead and ask Mark, and then we'll go ahead and Philip. Hey, thanks, uh, Mark Carroll for Aviation Week. I think I got a quick question. It had to do with the uh, uh, PMM ops, and I'm just seeking some clarification. You said moving material from there to the HTV, and I wondered if you were talking about like uh, packing material or trash or something you'd really just not want to take up volume on the station. Yeah, uh, yeah great question. And we're not getting that's all of the um, all of the packing. There's a launch restraint equipment. There's foam. There's uh, it, there, there was a video run around out there that uh, that involved what all packing went around Robonaut, for example, and that's a considerable amount of stuff that we don't actually that we absolutely need to protect that very sensitive uh, electronics and hardware for the the forces that we see coming off the pad. <clears throat> but once we get it in orbit, all of that stuff is really just in the way. So, so once we get Robonaut out eventually, and we're not going to unpack Robonaut, and I'm just using that as an example. But so there's a lot of launch equipment and foam and various other pieces of hardware in the PMM that were just there in order to be able to take the PMM uphill that we no longer need. So we can get some of that out and, and, and start uh, transferring it over to the HTV. So all the packaging that, uh, that came up with the vehicle, that's what I'm talking about doing a transfer. Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. I think for Art, um, to follow on Denise's question a little bit, um, can you talk about uh, the advantage to your team today to have Tim in the control center to help uh, to help go through the you know a couple of hiccups that you had uh, during the EVA? I think it was a huge advantage to have Tim. Uh, we kind of talked about this earlier um, as a team, that Tim's kind of uh, the alter ego of Steve in some ways, that he has a lot of the pieces that we've seen in training that Steve didn't have time to see. And so uh, when we ran into a few off nominal situations, uh, Tim had seen this type of thing in the pool and just had a little more experience, and he was able to help Steve along with everything. So yeah, I think it's a huge help to have Tim. And in this situation, uh, it was the, the perfect way to handle it. 
And, Thanks. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd throw on there also that, that Tim Coper's just an outstanding guy. He really is. I, I like Tim a lot. He, he's, he's worked really hard to make sure that Steve Bowen's ready to go execute these EVAs. I can't say enough good things about Tim Coper. He's a, he's a really neat guy. Okay, any further questions? Okay, well, uh, sounds like we're about ready to end this uh, briefing. Uh, just a couple of uh, programming notes for you coming up uh, overnight on NASA TV. At 8 o'clock Central Time, we'll have uh, today's video file. And then uh, coming up after that at 9 p.m. Central Time, we'll have today's flight day highlights package with all the best video of today's spacewalk. Uh, and then remember that 2.40 a.m. Central Time on Tuesday, uh, we'll have the ISS Flight Director update. And then, of course, the combined crew on the station is scheduled to wake up at 4.53 a.m. Central. With that, thanks a lot for being here.